Okay, welcome everybody. It's 8.30 p.m. My name's Ron. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Ron. How's all doing tonight? Uh, a couple quick announcements. During the, the, month, uh, the month of March, they have code blue at this church. So as you can see, we got half a room. Be mindful of that. If, the, if the, for some reason that they open this up for homeless people, we will be in a different room in here. Otherwise, maybe even possibly across the street, American Legion Hall, whatever. You can keep up with our, uh, uh, where we're going to be the night of, the day of, on our Facebook page, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown. Very simple to find. Keeps you connected to not only our group, but things are going on up and down the East Coast in AA. And if you ever, if you ever bored in AA, go on there. There's something going on every. If you want to drive around, it's a lot of great stuff going on. Uh, if you'd like a CD uh, of any of our speakers, past or present, we have over a thousand of them. They're absolutely free. If you want to give a donation, that's kind of nice. But anyway, if you get here early enough, we're usually here between seven. 7.15, uh, and we solve all the world problems ahead of time, so come, if you want CDs there. Our sister group is a big book study, meets at Salem on Thursday, 7.30 p.m. You can pick up the CDs there. We have a bunch of them over there. So see me after the meeting. Take them with you. They're, they're really uh, a powerful tool, especially for people who maybe even work on a Saturday night and can't be with us. So it becomes very important that way to pass them on and maybe bring it to somebody who is suffering. Maybe they'll hear a message of hope and recovery. Nick's birthday was just a couple days ago, and he's going to come up here and give his <laughs> happy birthday, Nick. So we got a happy birthday chairperson. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's good to be 21. Thank you. My name's Nick. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Nick. Welcome to Conscious Contact Ski Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a one-hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday night at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street at 8.30 p.m. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday at 7 p.m. until 7.30 right here. The purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance and service to others through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves with their first name? Yes, sir. What's up, Scott? Welcome. Hello. Hey, John. Welcome. Are there any announcements from the floor for the good of AA? Yes, you in the gray and black. My name is Heather. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Heather. Um, this weekend in New Jersey, we are hosting a conference. It is an um, Eastern Area Conference of Young People and Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't have to be young to attend. It's for it's a friend who has room to grow. So that's all of you. Um, it starts on Thursday, goes till Sunday. It's being held at the Valley Casino. Um, they are offering scholarships if you can afford the cost. Um, if you have any questions, you can see me after the meeting. That's all. Thanks, Heather. We have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see myself or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speed Group will provide you one. Anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big book and CDs to, to, to those who can't afford them can put donations in the jar on the table marked Big Book and CD Donations. If you'd like a CD of any speaker, past or present, please see myself or any home group member after the meeting. They're available free of charge. And with that, I have Diara come up and read the AA preamble. My name is Daryl. I'm an alcoholic. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. I've asked Amanda to read the 12 steps. Oh, that is not cool. All right. The A 12 steps of recovery. One. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. 
Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all of our defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrongly wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for our knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a real of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Thanks, guys, for reading. We have a seven tradition which uh, states every uh, AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. At this time, we'd like to pass the baskets. We have no dues or fees, but we do have expenses. This group provides many services. Your donations cover rent, big books, CDs, events, and workshops. Uh, once again, there is absolutely no smoking on church property. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. And uh, which leads to our speaker, a good, a good uh, friend of the Conscious Contacts Year group, comes to us on loan from the Katona Stories Group. I hope I got that right. From Katona, New York, Ruth B. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ruth. I'm alcoholic. Hi, Ruth. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the welcome. Yes, Katona. Um, I don't know if this will ever, I don't know if it ever gets easy. My heart is just pounding in my chest no matter how many times I've done this. So bear with me. I'm a little scattered. I am in a sort of an odd place spiritually in one of those um, just really questioning, questioning my experience um, in a good way, there's a wonderful man that I met when I was about six, no, six months sober. His name was uh, Joe Hawk. He has since passed on, and he had this wonderful way of talking about, uh, he introduced me to what, to what we call the set-aside prayer. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of that prayer. Yes, okay. So the set-aside prayer is this prayer that's not technically in the big book, but it kind of comes from different sections, predominantly from um, we agnostics. And the prayer goes something like, uh, God, please help me set aside everything I think I know about myself, about my alcoholism, about this book, these steps, most especially about you, so that I can have an open mind and an open heart for a new experience. Please help me see the truth. And that's how I was really brought through the whole big book and through the steps with that idea of what I think I know for most of my life is what basically almost killed me. And what I think I know and what I thought I know when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous was also standing in my, in my way of, of literally the name of this group, of, of having that conscious contact with this power that would allow me to stay sober and have the kind of life that would be useful and happy. And so I just feel like I'm in one of those places. And, and the other thing I'll just say is the way that I was taught to sponsor people is I got through the steps, and how do you know you've kind of been through the steps? You're like chomping at the bit to go carry this message to someone who's dying. I think I almost killed the first three women I tried to sponsor because, by God, I was going to get them sober, you know? But I had that experience, and I went, you know, this is what happened. Like, I was, I was on fire. What does Bill call it about Ebby? You know, he had that starry-eyed look. I was totally on fire. And the way that I was taught to sponsor also is when I sit down with a woman and we start at the beginning of the book and we start to go through those steps, I am revisiting my first step as well as walking you through your experience of step one as well. So it's just a weird sort of place. Like I told my story not that long ago and I was, you know, I was thinking about, I was actually almost like listening to myself saying, was it really that bad? I'll tell you, I got sober when I was 26 years old. 
I'm, I'll be 52 in April, so I've almost spent half of my life in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is miraculous, if nothing else. And um, and just just um, when I was talking that day, you know, sometimes I have this deal like, oh my God, I was such a disaster, I was such a train wreck, I had no successful relationships, I stole from every employer, I cheated on every partner, I, you know, totally abandoned my family. And I don't know that it was actually, it, it wasn't that black and white. I think time has given me a little bit of space and um, I don't really, I have no idea where I'm going or why I'm even talking about any of this, but, but this is where my head is at. So, so I, I, I will tell you, I have two parents that absolutely loved me. I don't think I had a day where I ever wondered whether they did. My father was somewhat remote. My parents were very much in love. I'm the youngest of four kids. I felt very kind of safe with my older siblings, um, and and it was like a pretty normal family. There was a lot of drinking. That's what I saw most of my other friends' parents doing. Uh, my godparents were screaming Bronx Italian drinkers, and my parents were Bronx Irish Catholics, and every Saturday night was just this wild thing where the four of us would just kind of sit on the steps and listen to what they were saying and listen to all these crazy words. And there was something incredibly attractive about whatever it was that they were doing down there. I was a really fearful child. Um, I had a lot of I had a lot of things that would probably make most normal kids feel reasonably well about themselves, but I never really did. I never felt smart enough. I never felt good enough. Always that low level of anxiety being around other kids, even though I had friends. I'm in school. I'm doing well, but I'm not doing well enough. I play sports. I do well, but I don't do well enough. You know, this is all the kind of thing that goes on in my head. So I had my first drink, I think, when I was about 11 years old, and I've heard this a million times in AA, as I'm sure you have. You know, it was just like taking my first breath. That's really what it felt like, this incredible sense of calm, ease. Everything is going to be OK. I'm sure that little boy likes me. I'm sure my sisters are proud of me, blah, 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 blah. I was out at a little picnic that our families were having. You know, and you have that kind of experience. For me, I wanted to have it again. Who wouldn't want to have it again? Nothing bad happened. I didn't get in trouble. I would say by the time I was 13, I was probably trying to drink every weekend. By the time I was 15, you couldn't get drunk in middle school in the morning, but you could do other things if you had a little bottle of Visine in your pocket. So I started doing things in the morning. So it's almost like, like I used to think, this is really what I think. I think the, the more I drank, the more I found the state of being sober totally objectionable. And it was becoming increasingly painful to be that way. And so I just have to do whatever it is I can do and whatever someone gives me so that I don't have to feel this way. So I know that I was a fearful child and alcohol treated that fear and that anxiety and then it made it worse. You know, and I never, I, never, I never saw that. I never made that connection. And I will tell you, that's basically my story kind of went like that. Um, I didn't, I did not, I want to say I didn't see the consequences, but then I know that that's not really true either because I was probably 16 years old the first time I had a really close friend start to talk to me about my drinking and about the way I was using other things and this is bad and I wasn't going to class anymore and I'd stopped playing all sports and I started being really disrespectful to my parents. And you know, you just kind of blow it off. There's this story about uh, the little frog in the pot. Do you know that story? So if you take a, if you take a, if you take a, if you take a pot of, don't do this, if you take a pot of boiling water, okay, you take a little frog, and you put it in the pot, the frog is naturally going to jump out of that pot as fast as possible to save its own life. If you take the same pot of water and you put it on a stove before you heat it up and you put the frog in and you very, very slowly crank up the heat, the frog will unwittingly burn itself to death in there because it can't really tell the burning is coming. And that's kind of how I see the progression of my alcoholism, you know, the, the decline of my moral health, as Bill, as Bill calls it. Every, more, every kind of moral code that I had 
you know, it wasn't like I went from being this little kind of person to being this outright thief and junkie and cheater and et cetera. It just happened from about the age of 11 to 26. And sure enough, at 26, I'm doing things I would have never in a million years imagined that I would do so that I could keep drinking and I could keep getting high. And uh, so, so what happened at 26, I have a really good friend and we do 12-step calls and we stopped asking the question, you know, are you done? The new question, or the new question a few years ago was, are you tired? Because I think that's really what characterized my bottom for me. It was not, you know, the last night out, there was nothing special about that night at all. I was just so exhausted from trying to keep it together and manage and do what I needed to do. I was in, um, I, I went to college, I loved college, I found a college in across the country that had no grades, I don't know if there are any others like that, but that's the one I found, and um, literally no grades, the grades were, were in large part based on small group discussions, which, you know, people like us, I'm very good at small group discussions, I can read a little bit and talk a lot about it, and um, and so I, I went to this college, I, I really did, I loved it. I loved studying, I loved philosophy, I loved religion, I loved psychology, I liked studying health. And you know, and I drank through the whole thing and I think you know, in that state you almost like I did, I did really not too badly. Um, it would be like Ruth did really well up until her final project which she failed to turn in so she, she you know, partial credit. I went to summer school, I graduated from college, I decided that I wanted to be a midwife. And um, the reason that I wanted to be a midwife, I will just say, I, I was 20 years old the first time I got pregnant. And at that time, I, I really felt like I had basically two options. I was either going to have an abortion or I was going to give that baby up for adoption. It never once occurred to me at that time to keep the baby because I was so out of my mind. <clears throat> And I ended up having I ended up having that baby <clears throat> and giving him up for adoption. I had this beautiful midwife that helped me through that whole process. It was the only time prior to 26 that I had any amount of sobriety. I think I was wasted the entire first 10 weeks until I found out I was pregnant. I stopped the day I found out. I did not stop. I, let me say it was removed. I don't know why. I've worked with a lot of women over the years that do not have this experience, that drank and drugged through their pregnancy. I didn't stop. It was simply lifted. And I started again five days after I gave birth, and I gave up my son, and I left that courtroom, and I started drinking again. I had this beautiful experience, as I said, with this midwife that kind of walked me through that whole process as best as possible. I will tell you from a moral perspective, I, <clears throat> I, I remember thinking I'm, I'm such a loser, I'm so ashamed of myself, I get, how, did I, how did I get myself pregnant? Well, if you have sex without protection constantly, <laughs> you're highly likely to get pregnant and being drunk, that's what often happened. So I just was so ashamed of myself and I felt like there were all these people that can have children and here I am and I'm going to just have this baby because I, I, I thought it was actually immoral to, to have an abortion. I didn't think it was immoral to have sex, but I thought it was immoral to have an abortion until a year later when I got pregnant almost to the day of my son's first birthday, doing the same thing, same behavior, nothing changed. Now I really only have one choice. And the reason I say that I will just say, I had an abortion, and, and that was, so I was 22 at that time, and that, those last four years were the worst, the worst four years of my life. Um, and I say this just for me personally, it was such a violation of my own personal little morality. Um, I had such a hard time living with it, just off like a ski jump. And... I'll tell you, fast forward, when I got sober, I had this beautiful home group. I had come directly from rehab. I remember them saying in rehab, if you're really serious about getting sober, see if you go to a meeting the day you get out. Not that weekend, not the next day. See if you go the day you get out and you get yourself a group and you get yourself a sponsor and you get yourself connected. You can change the group, you can change the sponsor, but this is what you need because you're going out into the big bag world. And 
So I went out, I got a group, I got a sponsor. I had this beautiful home group. It was, it was just perfect for someone like me. I could walk there, I didn't have a license. They took care of me. And I'll tell you, I was about three months sober sitting in a beginner's meeting in my home group and it occurred to me for the first time that I had given my son up, not for any moral reason at all, I had simply given my son up because I was not able or willing to stop drinking. And that's the kind of, you know, I, like, so I didn't know what I thought I knew and the stories I told myself about why I did what I do. You know, the stories I told myself about why I drank or why I drugged, you know, half of them are just nonsense. I think my most favorite one is, I don't care. Honestly, I just don't care. I don't care that you don't like me when I'm drinking. I don't care that I embarrass myself. I don't care that I hurt you. I don't care that I cheat on you. I don't care that I steal from you. And none of that was true. Not once was that ever true. Did it feel true at the time? Absolutely. I think the most accurate reason is what Bill says in the book. If you ask them in their hearts, they really do not know. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea why I drank the way I did. Obviously outside of the fact that I have alcoholism. But I really have no idea of why I did what I did and drank that way. I used to speak in um, the institutions and committees meeting in our area. I would go and speak at some of the local high schools. And I was speaking one day to a health class, like I think it was a seventh or eighth or ninth grade health class. And they just asked you to come in and tell, just briefly tell your story and talk a little bit about Alcoholics Anonymous. So these are a bunch of teenagers that are, you know, I know they're, they're obviously, it's very different telling your story to non-alcoholics, but especially a bunch of teenagers. And you know some of them are. So I tell my story and I try to tell it in a, in a cleaner sort of fashion. <laughs> and at the end of the 15 minutes, you know, they're all just sitting there kind of like you all are. <laughs> just sitting there, but they're wide-eyed and they have absolutely nothing to say. And the teacher's like, does anybody have a question? You know, nobody. It's like dead silence. And he's like, please, I know one of you surely has a question. And so this girl, finally, she puts her hand up just barely. And he's like, yes, what's your question, Sarah? And she looks at me and she's like, didn't you like know that it was really bad to be doing all that? And she was so earnest. And I looked at her and I said, yes, I did. You know, I knew. And I kept doing it anyway. So that last night out, I'll tell you, I'd left, I'd finished school. I moved back to New York. I was in nursing school to get my midwifery license. I was injecting substances at that time around the clock. I was getting sick every single day. I was going to really unpleasant places. And my sister Lisa, who's about who's a few years older than me, called me. And she to this day doesn't really she doesn't really know she doesn't really know why she did this. She called me on the phone. How are you? I'm fine. I'm stressed. School is really hard. Blah blah blah. She said, I want to do something with you. I want to do a little deep relaxation with you. So I lay down on the floor in my apartment. I had a pillow. I had the phone propped up next to me. And she put me through this deep relaxation. I was in, actually in withdrawal at the time that she did this. And if anybody's ever done yoga or anything like that, it was simply something like tighten your toes, relax your toes. Tighten your legs, relax your legs. Tighten your belly, relax your belly, all the way up my body. And by the time she was done, I was totally calm and quiet and relaxed in this apartment in Washington Heights, very quiet. And she said, and what I want you to do now is I want you to, um, I want you to lift your arms up and I want you to ask God or whoever or your guardian angel, whatever it is, to, you know, maybe, I, I don't even know what she said. I know she asked me to lift my arms up and I know she asked me to pray. And I got my arms up and I felt like my chest cracked open. And I hung up the phone and I laid there for I don't know how long and I just cried and cried and cried. And she called me about a week later. How are you doing? And what came out of my mouth, I will say it came out of my mouth because I had no intention of saying this, is that I, I'm really, really sick and I need help. Um, I know, obviously, looking back, and again, being in AA and working with a lot of women over the years, 
that was my first prayer. That was my first conscious, my first attempt at conscious contact. Um, I went through the book. I know for me personally, I had an experience with step one before I ever even crossed the doors of an AA meeting. And it was really that night. Somehow in that night, I had that experience that they talk about that I was literally beyond human aid, that when it came down to it, there was not a single human being on the face of the earth that would, able, that would be able to stand between me and a, and a drink. And, um, and so I ended up going to her house through a series of events. I wound up in this rehab. I'll tell you just a little bit about this first day in this rehab. I, um, I met this woman who was to be my counselor for the rest of the, four, of the four weeks, sat in her office, she does the intake, and she starts asking me these questions. And one of the questions that I remember is, what do you think will be your biggest barriers to sobriety? I, don't, I really honestly have no idea what I said to her. I said, her. I said to her something like, well, I really, really want to get high and I really, really want to drink. And she said, yeah, well, you know, you put more energy into that relationship than you've ever put into any other relationship in your life. And I said, that's not true. I have, I was engaged to be married at the time. I have these three sisters, these two sisters and my brother that I'm really close with and blah, blah, blah. And she did what any great sponsor would do and sat there and said nothing while she waited for me to spill out all these people that were so much more important to me than my drinking. And... You know, it's again, it's a spiritual experience. This guy, Joe Hawkey, used to say, anytime an alcoholic anywhere sees the truth, it's a spiritual experience. And he says, and they also don't tell you a spiritual experience. A spiritual experience doesn't always feel good. So I look at her, and she has the steps binder in her office, and I said, I, I read the first step. I read the second step. I read the third step. I looked right at her. I said, this is, this is about God, isn't it? And... <clears throat> She said to my everlasting thanks and appreciation, she said, yes, it is. I've heard a lot of people try to shy away from talking about that with someone, with, with new people, and, and I understand that, and I think that, that we use everyday language just like the book says. I don't know why she said that to me. I don't know why she didn't offer some maybe softer version, whether she just saw that, and the desperation that I felt actually when I said, is this about God, is that I just conceded that I can't stop. I know I can't stop. I tried every single, every single thing I could to stop. I knew that there was nobody that could stop me. If that's the case, you know, I'm screwed. And I see that it's about God, and I have no relationship with God. I have no understanding with God. I have a tremendous amount of baggage around the word God and prayer and religion and all of the other old ideas that I had accumulated up until that point. Um, and she introduced me to this idea of being willing and this idea of one moment at a time. And she said, I would like for you tonight when you go to bed to get down on your knees. And she was very specific about getting down on your knees to get down on your knees and simply say thank you. And when you get up in the morning to ask whomever or whatever to help you stay sober for just this day. And I did that. You know, I did that out of what we, you know, we know is the gift of desperation. I went to my room that night, I got down on my knees, and I think the prayer was something along the lines of, I don't know if you're there, and I don't know if you exist, but please help me, because I think I'm going to die. And my spiritual life, really, over the last 25 years, has simply been a little bit more of that. And it looks a little different, but essentially it all started. It started from that first nameless, wordless prayer with my sister when I was still active to that next prayer in my room that night in that rehab in Connecticut. And I got out. I joined that group. I got a sponsor. They were very, very big in the group I got sober in about having a home group, having people that see you on a regular basis, you know, I've shopped in AA before, or as, uh, what did my friend, um, my friend Rich say, I'm, uh, I'm auditing AA, that was what he was doing lately, he's, he's auditing AA, right, and I've audited AA before, 
But you know, I got this group, and, and what happened was these people, I, I, I started to identify with what they talked, right? I really started to identify with what they talked about. I identified with the hopelessness. I identified with, with the hope, right? It's not enough to identify with the hopelessness. My first AA meeting was actually before I went into that rehab. I had, um, before I went to that rehab on a Monday, I had tried to go into the emergency room that weekend because I hadn't slept in four days. I thought if you just walk in there and tell them that and tell them you're a heroin addict, that they will give you something to go to sleep, which they did not do. They gave me the number of a drug and alcohol counselor and said you can take two Benadryl that you can get at the CVS, and if that doesn't work, you can take two more and see how you feel. So of course, I proceeded to take six, and then I took four, and I slept for about 14 hours. And I went, I called, I called that woman on Monday, and I went with my mother to that woman's office, and she did the intake. She asked me those questions, for any of you that have done the, whatever the questionnaire is, you know, how old were you when you first drank, how much did you drink, how old were you when you first did this, did that, how often, what were the, con all these questions, and I'm, you know, I just, I just told her the truth as best as I remembered with my mother sitting there next to me, this Bronx Irish Catholic, pretty stoic woman with tears just sort of dripping down her cheeks. And that woman introduced me to the concept really of one day at a time. She said, I want you to go into this inpatient rehab, but we can't get you in there till Thursday. So you're going to go to a day prep program in the next few days. There's one tomorrow. We're going to have you go to a meeting tonight. Here's my home number. You can call me if you need me. You just do this one hour at a time. And I will tell you that more than anything, that Monday afternoon sitting in her office, I wanted to stay sober and go to that meeting and that was my plan and I was gonna come back the next day and go to that women's outpatient group and the rest of my life was gonna change. And my friend picked me up to go to the meeting that night and we got into the car and started driving down the road and I said, I don't know where you're going but I'm going downtown and you can come with me if you wanna drop me off. And that was my last night out. And I don't know why, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grace for me that that was my last night. Nothing bad happened. Nothing bad except, you know, nodding out on the road all the way home. I don't know how many people could have only... I just spoke at a drunk driving class also recently. You know, I think I never hurt anyone. You think about how many times you drove intoxicated in every single life you put at risk every single time we drove under the influence. I never really thought about that once prior to getting sober, ever. All the people that I put at risk every time I drove. So I did go to the outpatient the next day. That was my first AA meeting. It was a second step meeting. The woman who led the meeting would become my first sponsor. She talked about the second step. I had, you know, Charlie Brown, the teacher. I had no idea what she was talking about. I didn't understand any of the language. I was getting more and more uncomfortable. It's going around the room. I don't know what anyone else is saying. I'm so afraid and angry and it gets to be my turn and I just spewed whatever venom came out of my mouth and the woman sat up there and she just nodded her head. She didn't react, she didn't respond. She said whatever she said, what I heard her say spoke to my own experience. You know, it's that magic that can happen in AA. I knew sitting in that chair that she knew exactly how bad I felt and more importantly, that she didn't feel that way anymore. Most importantly, for whatever reason, the grace of God, I believed it was possible that if I kept doing whatever this thing was and went to this rehab that maybe I could feel the way she felt. And that's kind of how it went. You know, I think that's really the first and second step were like that. My home group, and this is a beautiful experience, when my sponsor got me ready to the third step, they brought me to what this little upper room in the church we met in, and there were maybe 10 or 11 women in that room, and they each went around and they shared their experience of the third step, and my sponsor gave me the big book, and she said, if you're ready to make this commitment, we would like to all sit here and be with you while you do that. And um, I'll tell you, if, you have, if, if you're working with others, if you have somebody coming up on that and you have some other friends in AA, it is a beautiful experience to bear witness to someone doing their first third step. And I took the book, I prayed that prayer, 
I, I, I started crying again. I don't know, you know, I wasn't crying much when I was out there those last few years. It was like I had to make up for lost time. I was crying constantly my first year. Just, I was a disaster, really. And I was a kind of little kid, like I would cry if I saw a dead animal on the side of the road. I cried watching Little House on the Prairie all the time, you know, watching those garbage move those commercials about garbage with that Native American man and that I'd be like hysterical I mean I was just constantly crying as a little child oh, overly sensitive as we say it takes many of us years to overcome this serious handicap but I was just a wreck my first year and simultaneously I was so excited about what about 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 what they were offering here that I didn't have to live this way anymore and you know that third step I offer myself to the to do with me as the, well, I can't remember what it says right now. I've only said it I don't know how many times, you know. But that's really I I knew that I was willing to do anything that anyone said to have this thing to not be the person that I was anymore. Um, and then we got on to four. I wrote my first fourth step, and the direction was write down a list of everything that ever bothered you, which I did, and um, I read it to my sponsor. The sponsor that I had had not had an experience going through the big book. The group that I got sober in didn't really use the book as a basic text. And so I wrote this fourth step, everything that ever bothered me. I did my fifth step with my sponsor. I read it to her. She gave me a little index card of what my defects of character were. I think they were basically like the, the you know, the seven deadly sins and they had little numbers next to them, I guess, of how many times. She recognized those, and it was at that time that I was introduced to my friend Bob, who was practicing the steps out of the, out of the big book, and he brought me to this workshop with this guy, Joe. And I came back to my group at the end of that weekend workshop, and I said, I really need to write another fourth step, as is outlined in the book, because I have no conception whatsoever of what my side of the street is. You know, this is basically a list of my resentments, and it doesn't show me anything about how I actually operate. And my sponsor, my, my sponsor basically said, you can, you can, and there were a bunch of young men that were sponsored by this guy, Bob, that were meeting every Friday night to do this workshop, and of course I wanted to go. I really only met Bob because I wanted to go out with one of the boys he was sponsoring. <laughs> and as my friend said, you know, God will make use of what's at hand, and that's how I got into the big book. Thank God for Earl. So... <laughs> really. So, I, so my sponsor said, you can go to that little workshop and you can get yourself another sponsor. And I, you know, and I, I remember actually quite like, is the, am I, is it really just about Earl? <laughs> you know, I don't think so. Like, I think, yes, there's, a, there's only men over there, and they're all pretty young, and half of them are pretty cute, and I really want to go, and I do like this guy. But something happened on that weekend when that man went through the big book. These, this book was written to give us the directions for how to go through these steps. This was our textbook. And, and when he talked about the fourth step and he talked about that four column resentment inventory and the freedom that comes when I finally can take responsibility for my own life and my behavior, it's not my father's fault. It's not my teacher's fault. It's not my best friend's fault. It's, not, it's nobody else's fault anymore. This is about taking responsibility for my own life. And so I got another sponsor. And at that time, there were, I don't think there were any women where I was. There were only a small handful of men and there were really no women where I lived that were trying to practice the steps out of the book. The woman who sponsored me, she just said, you know, she was beautiful. She said, I don't know what you're doing. I haven't done that, but I trust you. And if you feel that that's what you need to do for your sobriety, you go ahead and do that. And so I wrote that fourth step. I had a hundred and like 150 resentments. And and they, you know, they were they were basically. If I knew you, you were on my list, pretty much, right? I mean, that's the way it is. If I and even if I didn't know you, you were often on my list. Like I had this one on there was like the girl in the bar on Third Avenue, right? And why did I resent her? Because she went home with the guy that I wanted to go home with, and it was a huge resentment. Like I hated this girl. And then I had a couple more. I ended up reading my fourth step when I did my fifth step. I did it with my sponsor, and I also did it with my friend Bob, who is been a godsend to me my entire sobriety is one of my really one of my spiritual teachers <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> I read another one he's like so basically it sounds like you just hate all women <laughs> and I was like no well maybe yes I hate all women and I could you know who knew that 
I had no idea. I didn't hate all women. I was threatened by all women. I was, you know, and alcoholism is ugly <laughs> with women. I'm just telling you, you know, right? It's just not very attractive and it can get really ugly. And I was so threatened by women. And that's not who I am. I will tell you, for the last 10 years, I have, um, my spiritual practice outside of AA has been to be involved in a women's mystery school, which is really focused on the sacred feminine. And we do a lot of ritual and ceremony, and it's about, it's about empowering women as their own authority. I mean, sometimes I just, I, I think about that. That's what I get to see. I get to see my first fourth step where I hated all women to really part of my personal spiritual path is about working with women to empower themselves and to have an experience of the divine as feminine. Like, like, like that is what I, and that is a direct result of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, so I get to see stuff like that. I get to see like, I resent my father because he hit me, which was true. But I'll tell you, what I made up about what happened was so far beyond what actually happened. And then I get to actually see when I, by the time I, you know, I resent it because it hit me, it affects my, it affects everything, my self-esteem, my security, my ambition, my sex relations, my personal relations, everything, my pride. Say that prayer, setting aside the other person involved entirely, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. And I was told, you know, look at my behavior before if the resentment is really related to a specific incident, look at my behavior before the event, during the event, and after the event. And that's where I get to, that's where I get to start to get free. So I can see, you know, I began to see the kind of daughter that I was to my father when my father actually, this, you know, it happened, it didn't, it happened a few times. And when it happened, I would have been, I, I would have, I would have been hard pressed to have him do anything else the way I was behaving. And I was standing there and disrespecting my mother so abusively. And I'm not, I, and I say this meaning, you know, it's writing the four column inventory, it's never about what they did was okay or what they did was right. It is simply about what is my side of the street? Where did I set this ball rolling? How was, how was I selfish? How was I dishonest? How was I self seeking? Where was I afraid? Who did I hurt? You know, and then I use that experience for years after to justify my distance from him, to justify my behavior when he died. My, my father died when I was 19 years old, and my response, I was, uh, I was 18 when, he, when, when we, he was diagnosed with cancer. And my response to that event was to steal all of his morphine, right? And I got, that was the first time I ever got strung out on opiates. I didn't even know what it was until he died and I went into withdrawal because there were no more little purple and blue, pl blue pills hanging around the house. You know, and I look back on those kinds of things and I can't remember a single time in those six months from when he was diagnosed to when he died. I can't remember a single time thinking about what he was going through. I mean, this man is literally, he's, he's 58 years old. He's told he has terminal cancer. There's, no, there, 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 there's nothing for him, right? And I can't ever remember, I hated going to the hospital. I hated everything about it. I hated the way it smelled. I hated being around him. It freaked me out. It scared me. I don't ever remember thinking about what my mom was going through or my brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you, the night that my, the morning that my father died, I'd gone out drinking the night before and he died in the morning and my mother was begging the nurses on the floor to please wait another hour so she could find her youngest daughter because she had no idea where I was before they removed his body. You know, and you get to, you get to see stuff like that in the fourth column and in the eighth step, right? This is the kind of, this is, this is what I brought to that relationship. You know, and that ex those experiences of, and I think probably I, I can't say we can't diagnose any, I'm pretty sure my father was alcoholic. You kind of say, well, wow, he did, he, did, he did the best he could with what he had. His father was absolutely alcoholic. So that's the kind, that's the sort of the stuff that started to get unraveled in that fourth column. And, and, then, I, and then you do the fear inventory, and I'm afraid of everything. You know, I, I'm literally afraid of everything. I'm afraid of having a relationship. I'm afraid that I'm never going to have a relationship. You know, I'm afraid of succeeding, and I'm afraid of losing what I have. 
I'm afraid, I'm terrified of dying. I'm terrified of being alone. I'm afraid of strangers. I'm afraid of speaking in front of people. <laughs> you know, like, what if you don't like me? And what if I'm not meaningful? And what if, what if, what if you don't get a good message? And you know, it's just so self-centered. It's just, it's overwhelming, right? So, so I get to see that I'm, you know, it's what Bill says. It's this evil and corroding thread. The very fabric of my life is riddled with this fear. In the last few years, I was given this really beautiful, um, sort of what I want to call it, exercise for writing the fear inventory, which is basically I write the list of all of those fears. I ask myself a couple of questions like, how does this show up in my life? How does this make me selfish? How does it make me self-reliant? How do I try to protect myself from these fears? And I, and, I, and I get a much clearer picture about how it is that evil and corroding thread. And then I take a moment and I say that prayer, you know, please remove my fear and direct my attention toward what you would have me be, and I wait. I just wait, and I wait to hear what comes. If I was not afraid of being alone, how would God have me be? You know, open, honest, vulnerable, other-centered, compassionate, all those kinds of things, and it kind of gives me kind of like the sex ideal. It's something, this is my vision for the kind of woman that I want to be in the world, how I want to carry myself. And, and then the sex conduct inventory, again, was just more, it was more of the fear and resentment in a detailed way, specifically about my relationships. I had an awesome experience with this one sponsee once, and she wrote this beautiful inventory, and we get to the sex conduct inventory, and she reads her sex ideal, and it's something like, you know, I want him to be spiritually minded, and I want him to be honest and to have a sense of humor. I think she said something about loving animals. That was very important to her. And I want him to be a good communicator. I don't really remember what else she said. And I said, that sounds fantastic. I want you to just do one little change on there. I want you to say it in the first person, right? I want to be a good communicator. I want to be spiritually minded. I want to be compassionate. Because the sex ideal isn't about them, right? It's about us. It's about my vision of who I want to be in a healthy relationship as a sober woman. And I think it's really important. I think that's why I so love that, that um, exercise around the fear. And because it, it gives me a vision for, like I said, for, for who I want to be. So that's my fifth step, six, seven. I'm going to run out of time. And I always, I want to talk about like nine and 10 and 11 and 12. And there's never really enough time for that. So my ninth step, I could talk for another three hours about making nine step amends. I'll tell you, when I made my amends to my boyfriend that I had had the abortion with, and I just say this because it was shocking to me. So I, I found him. I, I, I flew out to Washington where I had really lived for seven years with the sole intention. I was about 11 months sober to make amends. I had all of these appointments set up. I was going to be there for five days. I was going to be in a lot of bars that I had gotten in a lot of trouble in and that I hadn't been in in a long time. And my, my friend Bob would just, you know, I had this anxiety. I'm going back. A lot of these people were not sober. I was told their sobriety is really irrele irrelevant to my amends, right? I have to be clear about my motive. I didn't get to take ex-boyfriends off the list, but it was very important that I was clear about what my motive was. Um, and so I found this man, and we had a beautiful talk, and when I finished saying whatever I said, I asked him, is there anything, is there anything I left out, or is there anything that you want to say or you want to talk about? And he said, you know, Ruth, I would have married you, and I would have had that baby. And I'll tell you, I never even mentioned the abortion in the amends. It did not even occur to me that that was something that I would owe him an amends for. And I think that's where I really started to have healing around that. Um, and that's the kind of, uh, I, have a, I have a really great friend who says, you know, I might get really clear in step eight about the harm that I caused, but the truth is I rarely have any idea of how that harm affected you. I rarely do. I, I uh, a bunch of girls in ninth grade, I don't know what we were drinking, we were smoking, this young woman, girl, who was not so cool as we thought we were, came into the bathroom, and it was like a flash 
pack mentality, and we decided in five seconds that we were going to flush her head down the toilet. And so we all picked her up, and we tried as hard as we could to stick her head in the toilet. And she had that, uh, like, Spider-Man superhuman strength, and you couldn't pry her hands off of the door. And then we got caught. We were suspended. It was like it never happened. I knew, writing my inventory, I have, I have got to find this woman. I have got to find this woman. I have to make amends for this. And I'm talking to Bob one day, and I'm talking about it, and this guy that he sponsors is standing, he goes, who did you say? And I said, Jennifer so-and-so. And he's like, oh, really? She lives right behind me. I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> so, you know, I literally drive to her house. I knock on the door. I don't think I knocked on the door. I think she was outside. Hello, how are you? I haven't seen her. I'm, I guess I was 28, maybe 28 by that time. I hadn't seen her in 10 years. And she hugged me, and I said, you know, I, I was wondering if we could talk. I did the whole spiel about I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. Part of my sobriety is about righting the wrongs that I'd done. Look, I, yes, yes. And I say what I say about this experience. And she looks at me, and she goes, oh, my God, you know, I was oh, I always felt so horrible that I got you all suspended. You know? I mean, I wanted to cry, really. So, like, not only did we humiliate her beyond belief, she spent the next 10 years, every time she thought about it, thinking she did something wrong. You know? This is, this is, this is the nature of how I, I rolled. I'll tell you this story about this woman, Anna, and maybe that I'll, I'll end with this. Um, so, I ended up finishing nursing school. I didn't want to be, I didn't, I, I, got, I got pregnant a third time. This one I had and I kept, <laughs> my daughter Ramona. I will also tell you that when my son Jake turned 21, we were able to be reunited. And he has been, a, I have a two and a half year old granddaughter. Um, I, I, it's, it's miraculous. Yesterday was his, yesterday was his four year AA anniversary. I don't want to take credit, but I will. <laughs> I mean, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I will tell. I know that part of the reason that 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 we got back in his life, my whole family, I mean, my whole family, his parents have come to stay with us. My daughter and I go out to stay with him, with his parents, with his brother. I mean, it's just amazing. And he spiraled out over those last years, and I, I, and I say, I, I am joking, but I was able through the help of AA, through my sponsor, through my friends, to get to a place where I could have a conversation with him that I never thought I could, and I didn't think I could have it, because if I tell him what I think and what I see about his behavior, he'll never talk to me again. I already rejected him once, he'll never speak to me again, and I think that was part of his process, was that conversation, and he ended up, he ended up getting sober about three months later. Um, and it's just really it's a mir it's it's a miracle. So so I ended up I ended up going to nursing school. I graduated. I had this little baby, so I got a job right away. Long and short of it is I ended up working in hospice, and I've been a hospice nurse for the last 15 years. And you know I know it's not a direct amends to my father, but it is a direct amends to my father. And so every day that I'm able to be with these people who are dying and be able to be with these families that are caring for them is this way that I can somehow try to balance the books of being such an epic failure when my father was dying and my mother was caring for him and my siblings were. And I, I had this patient, her name was Anna, and I absolutely fell in love with this woman. I don't know why. I think maybe she was one of us. We never really talked about it. She knew I was sober. I, I'd say I, I literally broke like every professional boundary there was with this woman, um, meaning I, you know, telling her about my life. She, I, she was on program for about a year, which is unusual for a hospice patient, and it was almost you know, it's always perfunctory. I would go to her house and I would check her blood pressure and listen to her lungs and do all that. And then really we would just sit at the table and we would talk. And we just had this sort of soul connection. And she had six children. Two of her daughters were in AA. They would often be there. We would just laugh. And she was pretty healthy when she came to our program. And she got progressively worse. And as she was getting sicker, she kept telling me, I, you know, God, I'd really like to meet Ramona which is my daughter. My daughter was about 10 at the time. I'd really like to read Rona. I'm like, mm, yeah, okay. 
And she'd bring it up again, and she'd bring it up again. And then finally I was just like, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come over on the weekend and I'm gonna bring Ramona. And I, this was just really important to her. I knew she didn't have a lot of time left at this point. She couldn't really get out of she couldn't really walk anymore. So I went over on the weekend. I brought my daughter. Her daughters were there. We only stayed for maybe a half an hour. And she and I liked to collect all of these little tchotchkes. And Ramona would go around, oh my gosh, what's that? It's so cute. And I was like, here, you, you, you have this. You can take it. You can take this. Ramona still has them. And it was very simple, quiet visit. Her daughters had done her hair in curlers the way women of that age like to do. And, you know, so her hair was all fluffed up. The curlers were gone. She looked beautiful. And they'd sat her up in this chair. And she would say periodically to Ramona, you know, your mom... She is the best nurse I've ever met, and I've met a lot of nurses. And you know, I used to be a nurse, and Rose was like, Yeah, yeah, what's that? Can I have that? And she's five minutes later, she'd be like, You know, I just love your mom. She has taken such good care of me. And then she'd move on to something else, and we left. And I'm driving home, and I'm thinking about what just happened, and it occurs to me that that is why she wanted to meet my, the only reason she wanted to meet my daughter was so that she could tell my daughter what a wonderful mother she had, right? So we have support and for staff, and I go to support, which is confidential, so I can tell them that I've violated every professional boundary by taking my daughter to see one of my patients. And I tell the woman this story, and I'm, I'm very overwhelmed by this. And I said, um, and I tell her, and she's like, well, don't you see what that woman what that woman did for you. And I said, I did, I do. How did she say this? She said, do you see what you did for that woman? I said, I didn't do anything for that woman, I'm telling you. And she said, you allowed that woman to be useful up until the very last days of her life. Right? And I feel like this is what Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to do. It has allowed me to be useful in a way that should not be possible for someone like me, someone like me who should be dead who doesn't have a right to be here if it were based on the way I conducted myself, and yet I'm given this opportunity every day to be of service. So I think I will leave it at that. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you all for listening, and thank you for the invitation. customary for us to form a line and thank our speaker personally. They come here at their own time and expense to share their experience with us. Let's thank Ruth one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Adam P. next week uh, from New Jersey. Be pretty quite colorful. Um, we got a, we have a, uh, if you'd like to give us a hand, we have to put all these chairs away except for the ones around the table. They stay. They all go on the rack. Don't forget the meeting after the meeting and if you'd like to uh, uh, Close with the Lord's Prayer if you guys want to circle up. Thanks for coming out.